Who's your emergency contact? Who should we notify in the case of death? Welcome to the USP, where I spent the last two plus decades of my life. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> you know when I share the stories about like how dudes from different groups, whether it's race or gangs, and they get into it one day and then they're cool the next day, but that when shit pops off, they all, everybody runs to their corner, you know, and backs up their side, whether that's that, their, that's, their gang or their group. And some people have issues that it's like, <clears throat> it's a contradiction, that it's a conflict, that how can you be cool and respect somebody that you just got into it with, you know? And I don't know how to adequately explain that, because it's just... Until you've been in the position that I've been in, until you've been in the environment that I've been in, you're not going to understand it. It's just the nature of the beast, you know? I got friends that are Mexicans. I got friends that are white. I got friends that are black. And through the course of my time, I didn't funk with them personally, personally, but I funk with their perspective group. You know, we bump heads with blacks. We bump heads with Mexicans, we bump heads with whites. But at the end of the day, we still have respect for each other and those individuals that are my friends are still my friends because, <clears throat> you know, the situation was never between me and these dudes that I respect or these dudes that I consider my friends. It was because of the politics and because the politics couldn't get figured out through conversation and we had to crash, and so be it, <clears throat> you know. So I want to give you an example of something like that. You know, I've, I've already mentioned that I, <clears throat> that I was in a riot, you know, 25 Mexicans on, the, on yard three. The whole unit blew up. But on this particular yard, yard three, there was like 250 Mexicans and 17 white boys. And me and uh, the homie Bryson, jumped in to <clears throat> to help, all right? Well, after the smoke cleared, after we came back into the unit, and after we got locked down and all that, and then got released a couple months later, released out of our cell, you know, there was high tension in the unit, you know, because one, you know, when me and Bryce was, in, was locked down, <clears throat> they had a dude named Brazil up top, and Brazil's a white dude. They call him Brazil because I guess he spoke Spanish or whatever, and maybe part of his family was Brazilian. I don't know, but he ran white. So I shot a kite up to him. I was like, man, what's going on? Like, what's up? <clears throat> I said, you know, me and, me and Bryson, uh, you know, got involved, right? So, you know, in for a penny, in for a pound. And... Well, from our perspective is that, <clears throat> you know, we're thinking, okay, the Pisces saw us there punishing some of their own, you know, some of their peoples and shit when they, when they came up on us. And we're a smaller group, especially compared to the, uh, the Pisces. And especially in the unit. In the unit, it's just me, Bryson, the homie Mujai, and the homie Fam. You know, but then they brought in uh, a couple other homies, a Lope from Alaska and this Vietnamese dude named Seven from the west side. After they started shuffling the unit around, they moved them two into our block. So there's six of us, right? But there's 40, 50 Mexicans in our block. So, you know, we're outnumbered 10 to 1. You know, <clears throat> And me, I've never been one of them dudes that's going to sit around and wait for somebody to come and butcher me, you know? So if I know that there's an issue and I know that somebody might feel some type of way about it, then just to <clears throat> make sure that I, that I end up on the winning side, I'm going to be the aggressor. You know, I'm always going to be the aggressor. You know, when a situation arises and I know that we can't talk this out, that 
because, you know, I always emphasize that certain, there's certain things that you can't talk about. When people break certain rules, when people cross certain lines, there's no conversation. You already know the conversation is not going to lead nowhere. So if you know it's going to go from point A to point B, then might as well get to B and cut all the bullshit in between. Especially if you're, if you're a smaller dude like I am, especially if, you're, if your group that you run with it's at a disadvantage as, as opposed you know, to numbers, then you got to give yourself every advantage possible to be able to win the confrontation. You know, when you were kids, like when you wanted to get in a fight, dude's like, all right, let's go fight on the grass, not on the street. Okay, don't poke me in my eye. Don't kick me in my balls. Don't bite me. Don't pull my hair. You know, these are rules for kids. When it comes to war, there's only one rule, man, and that's to win. That's to win by any means because the people that cry about it is the loser. You know, the losers are going to say, oh, he punched me in my balls. Oh, that fool bit my neck or whatever. The winners, they ain't going to cry about nothing. From their perspective, shit, I'm in a fight for my life, so I'm going to do whatever it takes to win this confrontation. So for me, you know, every altercation that I go into is always that mindset that I'm fighting for my life. And I don't see how anybody's mindset could be different because I've seen people get knocked out defenseless and get the brain smashed, smashed in, stomped out. Dudes ain't stopping because, you know, when you're in a confrontation, you get, <clears throat> you get stuck in the euphoric chaos, and you're there, you zoned out. You know what I mean? You in that, you in that moment, and and it takes something drastic, like somebody tackling you, you know, or a gunshot, to snap you out of that trance. Now I've seen it so many times that where people are just once they get knocked out, they're getting stomped out, and they become vegetables, paraplegic, and even in some cases, you know, lose their life. You know, if I've had, you know, I've been in an altercation where my opponent was knocked out. And because he was knocked out, it didn't stop me from continuing my assault because I'm stuck in that zone. And, you know, you, you're, you're emotional, you're angry, you're, you're on a high, a high not... Not like substance abuse high, but just you know all them all the chemicals that is going through your body, and you and you in that moment, and when you just going, and, and you know there's been a few occasions where if the police didn't jump on me, you know I might not have made it back home because I would have ended up with a body. You know and this is just the reality that of the environment that we live in. So going back to after the riot. You know, I'm letting the homies, I'm letting the dudes upstairs know, hey, man, what's up? What's the game plan? Because, you know, we outnumbered. I'm not, they about to open the cell up in the morning. You know, because they let us know when they're going to come and let us out for a shower or when the movement or when the lockdown is going to start, you know, being over and they're going to start letting us out for a few hours here, a few hours there. So I guarantee you, everybody in our cell block was preparing. You know, they already came and shook down. So, but you know, but when they come and shake down looking for the knives and stuff, it doesn't necessarily mean they find any of it. You know, people they're very proficient at hiding their stuff, putting their stuff away. You know. So, you know, we're already we already uh getting ready. We putting our property up, we pull our stuff out, everything, make sure that we give ourselves the best opportunity to survive. This chaos that's about to happen when this door cracks. So I shoot a kite up to dude. I'm like, man, what's up, man? What's going on? You know, we in for a penny, in for a pound. Because the Pisces has already seen us get involved. And from their perspective, it's like, man, I ain't got had nothing to do with the Asian Islander. Why you put your nose in it and all that. But for me, <clears throat> you know, we were defending a friend. And... My mentality was, 
we already did it. We can't take it back. So if you got a problem with it, then let's get it in. You know, and that's always been my mentality, especially if I believe that I'm on the right side of things. So they shoot the kite back, and they're like, oh, no, nah, it's cool, man. They had it. They had to, um, you know, when you, when you get locked down, they pull out representatives from groups, from different groups that are involved, and they let those representatives mediate the situation, talk about it and all, and the rest of it. And nine times out of nine, like those, those men that come together and have those conversations, they have an agreement amongst men that, hey, you know, if we agree to squash this, then it's squash. And in my experience, you know, for the last 20 something years, that these men uphold their, you know, uphold their words. They have integrity because you can't have a conversation with people if there's a history of them not keeping their word. You know what I mean? And we all know that we still have to, even after the situation, after the smoke clear, we still have to live in this environment. And if we can't trust each other to mediate and have our word be our bond, then there's never ever going to be any type of conversation when, when conflict arise. So like in my experience, in my history, you know, being on the yard, seeing an incident happens and this and that, you know, when the men get together and they say, hey, we're going to squash this. Or sometimes, you know, it's not like they're going to squash it between them, but they're going to go back and deal with their individuals, with the people from their perspective group, whoever's at fault. Because everybody, there has to be a resolution to everything. So they're going to sit down and be like, well, who started this? Why? And if he's justified and so on and so forth. And the two people, and the two conflicting groups, you know, they figure it out. You know what I mean? And at the end of the day, right is right, wrong is wrong. If your man is out of pocket and you're not <clears throat> going to discipline him or you're not going to correct that, then there's no reason for the other group, the opposing group, to negotiate with you or to have a conversation with you because they're going to assume that you're on some bullshit. And so that being said, everybody understands they got to correct and clean up their own garbage. You know, because if you got a homie out there that's running around, you know, stirring up shit just for the sake of stirring up shit and putting your people in jeopardy, then at some point, you're going to have to remove him, you know? So, Brazil, they come back, you know, they send the kite, because, you know, we shoot the kite up through the um, through the vent. In the vent, they got little holes in it, so I call up there and say, hey, man, drop your line down. So, they drop their line down through the vent. You know, I get a little, a little um, piece of freaking wire. I pull their their string through the vent, tie it onto my string, then tie my kite on it. So we we're going back and forth, communicating through the kite like that. And what came back was that you know, hey, they said it's squash. You know what I mean? This and that. But in my mindset, I'm like, man, how the white boys gonna squash this? Like they just got slaughtered. You know what I mean? They got caught slipping. They got slaughtered. And it was just, I was like, well, let's just see what happens, you know? So when I come out, and this is where my story is about right here. When I come out, there's, uh, he's not Mexican, but he runs Paisa. He's from El Salvador. His, uh, his name is Macheta, but we call him Pacalolo, you know, because he likes to smoke. And Pakalolo in Hawaii means weed. So we nickname him Pakalolo. And he fucked with us really tough. You know? <clears throat> like I'm in the unit, he's one of my kick kick it buddies. And um, so during the riot, you know, I seen him. I mean, he's on the and um the reason I say he's from El, El Salvador is people gotta understand that um when you go to prison and you're not the original part of these groups and you're forced to sign up to them, you're almost like a second class citizen. Like, okay, if you sign up with a Sereno, but you're not a Sereno, you're from Denver, you're from some other Mexican gang or whatever, but on this particular yard that you're running on, the Sereños run the yard, but now you got to get on count with them. 
When you get on count with them, they're saying, yeah, we're going to allow you guys to walk the yard with us. But when conflict comes, you're on the front line. And also, if you don't sign up with us, then we're just going to smash you off the yard off the top. So everybody, every Mexican that comes through, and it's not necessarily Mexican, but every uh, Latino, you know, comes through, unless you're Puerto Rican or Cuban. But if you're from uh, Central America, South America, you come through the California yard, you have two choices. You either run Sereno or you run Paisa. And if you, don't, if you don't get on count, you know, getting on count means if you don't, you know, be part of the group and fall under their umbrella, then they're not going to let you stay. They're going to smash you out, you know. And if you do stay, you have an understanding that you're a guest, that you're staying on their yard. So when, when shit arises that has to do with a different gang, a different race, you understand that you're on the front line. You know, you're the first torpedo, the first bullet that's, you know, going to be shot. So Fakalolo, him being from El Salvador, he's not part of the Paisa group because the Paisa is, is mostly Mexicans coming down from uh, Central America and, you know, an extension of the cartels. Like the dudes that have the yard for the Paisa, you know, I don't know. I never really dug into their history or their background or anything like that. But, you know, it's always emphasized that they were cartel members, you know, part of this family and that family and, and all the rest of it. So him being from El Salvador, him not being a gang member or anything like that, when he comes through the, through the yard in that water, he runs Spicer. And he hasn't really no choice, you know, so... You know, and I brought it up a few times with him through the course of our relationship. I'm like, Dad, what's up, Paisa? He said, man, I'm not no Paisa, man. I'm from El Salvador. I said, shit, you fucking running Paisa? And, you know, he looks at me because he's almost like, you know, and I, don't, I don't mean to do this, you know, put him in on the spot or anything like that. But sometimes we clown around and, and sometimes I just do it just to, you know, because I just want him to understand, you know what I mean? So, like, especially when he, you know, starts thinking he's getting above himself or something, you know, I, and I'm, you know, and I'm an asshole for it sometimes, but he's like, man, I ain't got no choice, man. It's just, you know, this is where I'm at, so it's what I got to do. So that being said, they had a couple incidents in, um, in the unit where he was sent on a mission, you know, where he had, his, he was sent to go smash somebody, right? So the first time. You know, he went and smashed one of the one of the other bices that broke their rules or whatever. And he comes back, you know, he gets in, he goes to the shoe for about a month. You know, I don't really know the particular of those incidents, but he goes to the shoe for about a couple months. I mean a month, when he comes back out. And then like two weeks later, I see him, him and a couple other dudes going putting in some more work, smashing somebody up, you know, smashing another bicer for whatever. So this one I mentioned, like, this one I found out that he was from El, El Salvador and all that. So when he comes back out of the shoe the second time, I'm like, damn, what's up, homie? They ain't got nobody else to send on a fucking mission? They just using you up? And that's when he explained to me, like, yeah, I'm from El Salvador. So, you know, when shit comes up, he's always going to get nominated. You know, why the, why the core group, the ruling class, sits back and does their time they let these visitors, the guests, the affiliates, however you want to describe them, deal with all the bullshit, you know? So, because, you know, I'm like, yeah, you're just a little do boy, right? And he, you know, he kind of got upset with me, be, you know, because I'm clowning him. But he's, but then he's, you know, that's when he let me know, like, hey, man, I, you know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not really part of their group. I just run Paisa because of the situation that I'm in. But really, I'm from El Salvador, and I don't, you know, I don't gang bang or none of that stuff. You know, he came over here across the border, you know, trying to feed his, uh, trying to make a living out here in America and sending his money back to his family in El Salvador. And the reason I'm sharing with you the story is just, you know, like him in particular, you know, I watched him for the few years that we were there together in that unit, in that block. This dude is selling sodas, he's making candy. 
You know, he's hustling. He's not selling drugs, nothing. He's he's hustling. He's carrying fucking 100 sodas out to the yard a day, making it three stamps at a time. And every single week, he's cutting a check and sending it to El Salvador. He's like, look, bro. He was like, man, I got wife and kids back home, man. See this, you know, he come, he showed me on the computer that, you know, he's sending it back home. He goes, yeah, I came here to take care of my family, got caught up. You know, I didn't really un uh, get to know or find out why he was in, in there for. And, you know, he's not my people really, so he's not part of my car. So it wasn't like something that was important to me. But just watching him grind away, hustle every day, just to send uh, money home back to El Salvador, you know, gave me a different perspective on some of the people that was in the penitentiary, you know, and he and he's in there for a legal entry. You know, right now, everybody can come over here free, right? No problem. Jump the fence, crawl under the fence, or whatever. But back then, they was giving you time. You know, when you came in, you got caught up. A legal entry could carry you up to five years. Re-entry carry 10 years. There's been a few, a lot of uh, Latinos that come from South America and Southern America that are in there for a 10-year bid for re-entry. You know? But that's for a different different day. So when we come out of the, after the lockdown, after the riot, we come down, we come out, you know, some of the white dudes like, hey, man, <clears throat> you know, because they know me and me and Pacalola fuck with each other tough. You know what I mean? He sat at, he sits at, he's welcome to, to our table. We broke bread. We ate together and all that shit. Like, we're not buddy, buddy, homies, but he's somebody that we're cool with and somebody that I like. And they're like, man, Buckalolo was, uh, so they were telling me, because, you know, during the riot, I'm in my own confrontation. I I don't know what's going on outside. I am I got four or five dudes in front of me with knives, and I'm fighting them off, keeping them from coming, getting past me. And not one of them got past me, you know. <clears throat> but Buckalolo, in the beginning, he was part of the first wave. And I'm standing in the corner by the track by the two fence on the, on the corner on top of the track. And about 15, 20 feet from me is my poker table. And I watched them as they were coming out. And Buckalolo was one of the first ones that came, that came out. But he didn't walk up on the track where I was at. He walked through the poker tables to get to the white dudes. And, you know, after that, I don't know what happened because when the, when, the, when the bices got close to me, I took off, and I'm, I'm in it, right? So when we come off of lockdown, some of the white dudes was telling me, like, hey, man, you know, some of the other people, other, other races and stuff that was in the unit that was watching it out of the window, they're like, damn, man, uh, Buckalolo is, I, I know you guys fuck with him tough, but, man, he was over there fucking pulling in the work, and I think he was right behind you while uh, you was getting into it. You know, so I'm like, oh, yeah? All right, because, you know, I understand that, you know, the situation didn't have anything to do with me and mines. You know, we got involved because one of the white dudes was one of the homies' cousin. But, and I also understand, like, when shit pop off, everybody runs to their corner, you know, goes to, runs to their side of the ring. So I'm watching, you know, when we come out, there's a lot of tension in the unit. And when I was saying that, you know, our desk is, uh, our table is a round table. So Bryson's on one side looking this way. I'm sitting on, you know, we're sitting on top of the table with our feet, both of our feet flat out on the ground. And Bryson's looking this way and I'm looking this way. Because, you know, even though they say everything is squash, you never know how some people feel. So I'm not going to be having my back to the unit with my head up watching TV and my headphones on. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to stay, I'm going to stay ready at all times. That's just the nature of the beast. So, you know, the first day we come out, you know, we post up. Bryson's watching my back. I'm watching his back. The homie sitting around the, uh, around the table. And we're just observing, you know, because, <clears throat> you know, you're going to be able to see 
if somebody's trying to make a move, you're going to start seeing them crowd up. You're going to start seeing them whisper, you know, in each other's ear, plot, whatever. Because, you know, this is the first chance that everybody's got a chance to talk. And everybody's having their group group meeting, you know, I'll, you know, every race, every race. The blacks are strategizing about what's going to happen if these two groups jump back off, you know, where they're going to go, or what they're going to do to protect, you know, everybody's going to, you know, come up with a strategy to protect themselves. So everybody's in, you know, just like us. When we're sitting at the table, we're having that conversation. We're not having it in a cell because for us, we're such a small group. You know, there's only like five or six of us in there. I'm not trying to be in a cell trying to politic about what happened and then have our whole cell surrounded and these dudes rushing in on us. So we we out in the open. We out in the day room on a table. Like I said, we post it up and we just watching while we're having a conversation. You know, I'm surveilling, you know, everything around me. Bryson's surveilling everything around him. And same thing with the homies that's there, you know. <clears throat> so after like an hour or so that we were out, after we started moving around a little bit, you know, a couple of dudes came and mentioned to me about Buccalolo, about, you know, how he was standing behind me, you know, during the incident. So I'm watching him. I'm watching his cell. I'm watching things, you know, people going in and out of his cell, this and that. And I'm waiting for opportune time that he's in there by himself, you know. For me, I'm going to address the issue, especially when I consider you a friend. I'm not going to sneak you or anything like that, but I'm not going to put you on blast or I'm not going to have, you know, some type of confrontation. I just want to understand where you're coming from, you know, on a man time, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. So when his sales clears out and it's just him, I go to his I go to his cell. But I don't knock on his door because you know I'm coming with a little aggression too. You know what I mean? I'm coming to, you know, like if the conversation doesn't turn out the way it's supposed to turn out, I'm gonna punish him because, you know, that's just how I felt at the time. So I come in, I open the door, I say, Hey, what's up, Buckalolo? I say, What's up, homie? He said, Oh, what's up, Mesa? I said, What's up, man? Man, I got a couple of people say you was going to stab me in my back. No, Mason, no, nah, man. I said, what's up? He said, no, nah, man, I seen you. You know, and he was like, you know, because he was on the first wave and he was putting in work and he was just, you know, from his demeanor, you know, when I'm talking to him, I'm looking at him in his face. I'm looking in, in his eyes. I'm trying to see his expression. If he divert his eyes from me, if he puts his head down, you know, looking for all the all the telltale signs that somebody's lying to you or being guilty about something or, you know, all the rest of it, you know. So, you know, he was like, he's like, Mason, man, you're my friend. And, you know, the, some of the white guys you see, they're my friends. But I have to. I have no choice, you know, because he got set on the mission. He was on the first wave. But I was like, yeah, but I, people was telling me you were, you were standing behind me. And he's like, yeah, I was standing behind you. I see you beating up my paisa, beating up the paisa. Because, you know, I'm fighting these dudes, but on the second wave, I got one of them on the ground, and I'm punishing him, you know. And uh, the people was telling me they seen uh, Buccalolo walking back and forth behind me. He said, man, I see you, man. I just walk away. You're my friend. I don't have no problem with you. I don't even want to be involved in this shit. And I just, yeah, I didn't do nothing and I wouldn't have done, and I wouldn't do anything, you know. <clears throat> so really, like, you know, when you're in the penitentiary, you're going to put, you're going to get put in um, some tight situation, you know, some hard situation. And that's when You know, you, you get to decide if you're a man or if you're a do boy. You know. And it's a fucked up environment because, like, you know, you're damn if you do, you're damn if you don't type of situation. Because you still got to live there, especially if you got decades to do. You still got to abide by the politics. And you still got to have to, like, go with the crowd mentality, especially if you signed up with some, um, you know, with a group. But sometimes, 
you're going to be asked to do things that might not sit well with you. And when those times come, you get an opportunity to really evaluate yourself. If that, if you're a man that can stand on your own two feet, or if you're just going with the flow to get by and you're willing to compromise yourself. And for me, I'm not here to judge anybody, to say what is right, what is wrong. I'm just saying that when you're locked up, homie, you're going to get put in those predicaments. You ain't going to put in situations where you got to make the hard choices. And, you know, like it's just, like for me, and I only speak for me. I don't speak for anybody else out here. I don't, I don't judge anybody else for what they've done, why, they, why they're in there to be able to survive the environment that we lived in for the last two plus decades. You know, that's not my place. I'll never do that. You know, but I like to think that through the course of my time that I've conducted myself with integrity, that when I had those hard choices to make, that I made the right one. You know, by no means was every decision, did every decision sit well with me, you know, or that, <clears throat> yeah, you know, <laughs> but at the end of the day, you know, this is the situation we're in, man, and everybody's is just trying to figure out how to survive, you know, the environment the best way they know how. But at the end of the day, there's men that stands apart from the rest of them, and those men, at every opportunity, they always stood on integrity, whether that means bucking their own homies to stand up for principles. <clears throat> you know, for the rest, and I like to think myself that I was one of those men that was able to stand on my own two feet and never compromise. But that's not for me to, you know, <clears throat> try to convince you. That's just, you know, for people that's been locked up with me or whatever, they can say, yeah, he's he's that or he's not. And But I, like I said, I'm not, you know, when I come on here, I'm pretty confident that everything that I tell you is what it is. And I'm pretty confident that the people that's been around me is going to be able to stamp who I am. That being said, man, thank you for watching this ep episode. You know, and again, I ask you guys to go to my TikTok and subscribe on there. I'm trying to get to 1,000 followers so I can go on TikTok Live. Um, I got my tattoo shop popping uh, in a few weeks. Um, we're finishing up the paint job on Friday. Today right now is Thursday morning. So on Friday, tomorrow, we're going to be bringing all the, like, tattoo chairs and all the furnitures and stuff in there to start putting it together. You know, we got, um, just to give you guys a little update on what's going on, I've been talking to a couple of people that uh, that do uh, music videos and films and stuff, and we've been in discussions about certain projects that I want to bring to light. Like I said, man, you know, I apologize for not being consistent on the things that I'm doing right now, but it's just, I got a thousand things going on, and I just ask you guys to stick with me because I really believe that I got some things coming down the pipeline that I'm working on that's going to be worth the wait, you know. And it, and at the end of the day, you know, my objective is not just to sit here and share prison stories with you guys. I'm trying to find a way of find a, find a space where I can make a difference. And, like, again, I hope you guys support me. Man, go to my website. BaddestManAlive77.com Support the cause. It's not just about selling a t-shirt. It's not just about a beanie, man. It's about, you know, a mentality that we're trying to push out here. You know, it's about a change of consciousness. And I love you guys' support. Thank you so much. Till next time, welcome to the USP.